It's a lazy, sultry afternoon in Maryland. The lawnmowers are mowing, the bees are buzzing, and my husband Doug and I are sitting at my mom's kitchen table, but we're not eating. We're on a conference call, two artists and two rival geneticists, who I will call Gunther and Sean, who are in the middle of a huge argument. And as they really go at it, I finally can't stand it anymore. And I blurt out, which side is left behind? We have to show something. What they were arguing about was whether the sense or the antisense side of RNA is left after being cleaved by Dicer and taken up by Argonaut. RNAi, or RNA interference, offers the promise of being able to shut down certain diseases by silencing proteins. We were collaborating with Nature Reviews Genetics in London to build this animation, and they had put us in touch with these experts to help us understand the science. The fact that these scientists were arguing was not remarkable because they tend to argue an awful lot. What was remarkable was that Doug and I, as artists, had posed the question which provoked that argument. And in so doing, at that kitchen table, we found ourselves on the very edge of what was known. It was remarkable. It gave me, for a split second, what it might feel like to actually be a scientist on the edge of discovery, and it also revealed to me the synergy between art and science. A thought occurs to you. It's this beautiful little bubble. You send that thought out into the world, and what happens to it? Well, most of the time, they pop. But sometimes, that idea will float along and land on the far shore of another mind, where it takes root. And that idea blooms. Acquisition. Translation into comprehension. And then, that person may float an idea back to you. This mental game of catch is what makes science go. But how do these ideas move? Art is the air through which thoughts float. It buoys them. It wraps them in color, shape, context, motion, meaning for the rest of us. It can inspire, but it can also destroy that thought. So thought, so care has to be taken. And I am not saying that art for art's sake isn't useful or valuable, because it absolutely is. Art is oxygen. We cannot survive without it. But in the context of serving science, conveying an idea from one mind to the next is art's mission. Art and science have a symbiotic relationship that cannot be overlooked. But these two worlds have drifted apart. What's happened? Science is the collective curiosity of the human mind. Art is the soul of civilization. There is not a single culture on this planet that doesn't have one expression of art and one form of science, however basic. So how do we bring these worlds back together again? There's a little town in Tennessee called Oak Ridge. It was part of the Manhattan Project during World War II, a secret city. There were more scientists, mathematicians, and engineers there than you could shake a stick at, and I grew up there. And I thought, until I left Oak Ridge, that everybody in the world was one of those. I really did. But life presented two paths to me, art and science. 
And I didn't think I had what it took to be a scientist, so I chose art. I had so much support from my family and my friends, but I somehow felt that I had chosen the lesser path. And even though these people surrounding me thought that I could do no wrong, it didn't make sense to me. I didn't understand why I felt like what I was doing was less than. And here's why. I finally figured it out. Society looks at art like it's a luxury. It's really nice, but it's not that necessary for human survival. Science is this cold, impenetrable box. It's threatening, but it's a necessary evil. Science is the realm of fact and truth. And art is beauty and fiction. Is that true? Do you think art and science are equally valid? You may not. There are many people who don't. If you look deep down in your soul, science is here, art's here. It's really beautiful. It may be off here somewhere, but it's like this. So how has this happened? Why are these worlds so far apart from one another? Scientists want nothing more in the world than to tell you about what they're working on. They are dying to tell you. But if you don't know their language, you can't understand what they're talking about. Because discovering something or inventing something is radically different from telling somebody about that, which is altogether different from, from showing somebody. And science begs to be shown. So, all this was going on, and it finally came to a head when I came across this book. And it crystallized my thinking about what happened to these two worlds. In the 17th and 18th century, in London, the Royal Society, science, the Royal Academy, art, lived in the same building called Somerset House. I would have given anything in the world to walk down the halls of this place where these scientists and artists were collaborating, they had studios, they had laboratories, they were experimenting together, and they viewed one another as equals because they were equals because most of them were both. Then, both groups got bigger, and in 1837, the Royal Academy moved out. That is the year Market. That is the year where these two worlds began their tectonic shift away from one another. And even though there are people who are trying to bridge this divide, and there are a lot of them, I think that in society these days, these worlds have never been farther apart. But the truth of the matter is, as humans, and we are all humans, we require stories. I find it fascinating that there are this many synonyms for the word story, and that's just the English language. We need them to process and understand information. I have one of the most fascinating stories that I've ever heard, and it's happening inside every single one of us right now. It's called your immune system. It's not called the forever war for nothing, because it never ends. There is no command center. You just have millions of little cells all working together with one purpose in mind, that's to keep you alive for one more day. If the system says the wrong thing or stops talking, that's when disease can happen. And it's kind of like society. You have these bad elements, but society will usually take care of that. But when society doesn't deal with that well enough, that's when you get things like cancer cells, which can basically get away with murder. Or 
you have psoriasis. This autoimmune disease tricks your system into thinking that you are the bad guy, and you go after yourself. Or say you have an allergy, you breathe something in, your body goes into hyperdrive, you have mast cells that start spewing out cytokines and histamines, you feel awful, or you may have a really bad infection, and you send in the big guns, which are neutrophils, nature's little cluster bombs, which blow up and just destroy everything in an area to give you a chance to reset. This is full-scale war going on inside of you all the time. And you generally don't know it unless you feel really bad. These are classic storylines of birth, death, betrayal, subterfuge, mimicry, heroics, self-sacrifice. And the fact that these stories are real is what makes them all the more compelling. And art can show that to people. I think this guy said it best. Study the science of art. Study the art of science. Develop your senses, especially learn how to see. Realize that everything is connected to everything else. You, we, have the capacity to fold that thought into every waking moment. And here's why that's important. Art can entice people to pay attention to science. Of those people, some are going to turn into scientists and they will solve some of the big problems we've got going on right now. Other people will be artists. They will illuminate the science for other people so that they have an appreciation for it. There are three things I would love for you to think about and do. Learn more science than you already know. It's not that hard. There's a lot of it out there. Make or find some art that will explain something that you learned to somebody else. And then do that. Take that art and explain it to your brother, your husband, your child, your grandmother, your friend, your coworker. Share that experience of wonder. We are all members of the most technologically and scientifically advanced civilization that this planet has ever known. We all have brains, we all have power, and we all have creativity. Use it. Own it. Make things better. Float that bubble out in the world and see what ideas bloom. Thank you. <laughs>